So every week, uh, every Friday, the Minding Your Business podcast comes to you courtesy of Brooks Brothers Consulting. Brooks Brothers Consulting was started with my brother Philip and I back June of 2013, where we add value by providing leadership talent development. So leadership talent development for new managers or existing managers. So you could be new to a company uh, or you could be new to the leadership role, whether an executive, director, or manager. You need the kind of partner and mentor by your side uh, to help you navigate those waters to be successful in your role. So whether you're working W-2 or you're a 1099 contractor or you're a small business owner, you need the kind of critical thinking skills to develop, particularly early on, Uh, in your walk, new to the company or new to the role, most companies aren't going to sit and handhold you when you're in leadership. So that most companies are very good at providing job skill training, but they're not as adept to providing leadership training. And that's where we come into play. We've worked with several banks and credit unions, um, working with a bank now, just got done with the bank, worked with a, um, a staffing company. Uh, here a few weeks ago, and so uh, the business is really picking up, and we're able to help a lot of people. So 901-808-3801. That's 901-808-3801. That's Brooks Brothers Consulting. You can check us out at www.brooksbrothersconsulting.com www.brooksbrothersconsulting.com As you always know, we're live on Facebook Live with the Minding Your Business Podcast Facebook page as well as my page, Champ Ron, as I'm your host, Champ Ron. So Champ Ron Brooks on Facebook, if you want to jump on there now, uh, if you happen to be listening live on Spreaker with the podcast, you can do that. Uh, The podcast, www.themybpodcast.com Apple Podcast, Google Play, YouTube, Uh, Spreaker, Stitcher, SoundCloud, anywhere that you get podcast content, you can check out the Minding Your Business podcast. Entrepreneurship, real estate, trending news. There's no business like Minding Your Own. Let's turn up the music and we're going to get to our guest. What we do here is go back, 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 back. Today, again, I'm your host, Champ Ron. This is the Minding Your Business podcast. Again, Friday, June the 1st. This is episode 49. So, you know, the next episode that we've got coming up is very special. We're celebrating our 50th episode. And people may ask, well, you know, what's so special? You know, Ron, what's so special about that? (laughs) Well, that's a great question, so let me tell you. Um, Many podcasts and many shows these days, um, there's a million podcasts out there, but many of them don't make it to the 50th episode for a number of reasons. One, um, they have to have a good proof of concept. Uh, The host has to be engaging and there has to be some level of following for it to be worth your time. As you know, this isn't something that I'm making money off of or doing that kind of thing. I, I use it as a platform. Um, for others and not just for myself and so that takes a level of dedication and everybody that starts a podcast again it doesn't survive for various reasons so you become very fortunate 
um, when your podcast can have uh, some level of followership and uh, people who enjoy it and, and see it as a resource. And so I'm glad to have been able to do that. We just started this podcast uh, back August of last year. We changed the name to start this year from I Really Mean It to the Minding Your Business podcast. And so I thank you all for all your support and sharing the podcast and you know recommending guests and you know the good, bad, and ugly of whether you agree with things that I say or not. Uh, it's good dialogue, and it's good for us to be able to engage so that we can continue to edify. And speaking of edification, that's one of the words that I uh, attribute to this brother that's sitting uh, to my right. And I, I want to introduce him, and he, you know, I came to know him several years ago through um, you know, just other business opportunities, things that were going on in the city, and you're able to connect with brothers. And you know, sometimes that... Um, but dang, that's yeah. know, we, we might have to get them to turn that off. You know, two on. I know, you know, we got the Marvin going, but you know, sometimes your know, Marvin kind of hits you. We'll let that pass, man. Some ladies over here, so yeah, we'll let that kind of pass. Yeah, uh, hopefully more ladies will. Too, yeah, so yeah. two dudes in here talking with <laughs> sexual healing playing. But anyway, I met this brother a few years ago, man. He's he's a good brother. Um, you know, we've been through different times together. Yeah. Um, been able to see him grow. He's been able to see me grow. And, you know, just a, a good-hearted brother for the community and for people in general, which is not easy to find, you know, ever, much less in, in today's society. So I was thrilled when he was available to be able to come on the show today. So I want to be able to welcome uh, Mr. Gil Carter, the founder of the First Year Foundation Incorporated. All right. Yeah, so, brother, what's going on, man? How you doing? I'm well. I'm well. <laughs> I'm well. I'm very blessed to be here. Shout out to everyone who's listening and watching, uh, everyone via Facebook Live, and of course, uh, the Mind Your Business podcast uh, website. But again, I'm doing well, doing well. I always have challenges, but... You know, we I, all do, man. Yeah, I mitigate yeah. the circumstances with those and you know, continue to move forward. So there I'm definitely go. blessed to be here today. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. So, so what's going on with you? What you got going on these days? Um, you know, and tell people maybe a little bit about your background and kind of how you've gotten to be here. I know you've got uh, an extensive background and you know interesting background yeah. uh, for those that uh, may not be familiar. So, kind of share with them, you know, how you got to this point. Mm -hmm. Academically, uh, I'm a student at the Lamar Owen College. All right. So I'm very proud to not only represent Memphis as I do things, but represent LOC. I'm very proud of our school and how, from a transformational point of view, it has grown. Yeah. You know, and there's much more growth to be facilitated by leadership there. And, you know, there are some prevailing thoughts about how that uh, growth should be uh, facilitated and whatnot. Uh, yeah. But I know it's going to happen for the better. Uh, so shout out to everyone uh, over at LOC. Uh, yeah. Magicians in the house. Uh, <laughs> Definitely uh, blessed to be a uh, part of such a great institution. Uh, but with that background, uh, specifically with business uh, administration, business management, interestingly enough, the majority of my work experience since I've been a Memphian, that's going on 17 years now, okay. very proud to say that, yeah. has been in uh, child welfare, nonprofit management. So from that, I started the First Year Foundation Incorporated, okay. uh, which is known as First Year for short. And we are a nonprofit organization with the main focus of the dramatic reduction of fetal and infant mortality here in the city and the county. And we have a specific focus within that main focus of helping women achieve optimal maternal and reproductive health through emphasis and execution of fitness, health and wellness, and proper nutrition. So I was able to marry two of my affinities. I was able to marry my yeah. love for children and my love for physical fitness. Yeah. And okay. You know, that's uh, arduous. That being growing a nonprofit organization in a city such as ours where the philanthropic base is so strong. Mm -hmm. uh, I know for the last several years, by the numbers, we've been number two to only Salt Lake City Metro in terms of major metropolitan areas where the philanthropic base in terms of dollars mm -hmm. uh, for various uh, charities and outreach causes uh, uh, nationwide. You know, at that level. So, you know, yeah. we've only been, uh, you know, two to Salt Lake for, you know, the last several years. And, you know, uh, my thought was, you know, to be 
in a city where you know that philanthropic base is so strong, it'd be challenging, right? You know, right. building a nonprofit organization because you know people don't always see the needle move. Mm-hmm. Uh, they don't always see tangible results. Right. But people think charity or nonprofit organization. Oh, I can just freely give. Right. You know. I feel good about freely giving to a charity. I feel good about freely giving to a nonprofit organization. But again, behind the veil, behind mm-hmm. the curtain, you know, they don't see the again tangible, right? You know, results. Results. Right, yeah. right. You know, that, that's a whole other conversation. That's a whole other podcast. Right. I don't want to get into the weeds <laughs> on that. But I'm very blessed to be able to start first year and still growing it, still growing yeah. it. Um, and I'm in a process of uh, writing two books. I'm a part of a book collaboration project right now. Uh, speaking of Facebook uh, friends, I want to give a shout out to Miss Angie Renee, who is one of uh, two parts of the dynamic duo in terms of uh, two <laughs> fantastic sisters who are uh, leading this project. So shout out Angie yeah. and Taria Avant, uh, who's in Atlanta by way of Houston. Angie is in Atlanta by way of St. Louis, so I'm very blessed to be able to work with them. Okay. And then I'm also in the process of completing my manuscript for my first solo book project. And we're going to get into that just a little bit today. Yeah, at your leisure. So yeah, definitely, I'm definitely excited to talk about that. Yeah, definitely, man. And so let's jump right into that. So you know, tell yeah, for the audience, you know, for your upcoming book. So it's your first kind of solo book. Uh, congratulations on that. Thank you. By the way, and you're right on both forward, projects. So yeah. thank you. Yeah. Yes, I am. <laughs> yeah. So I was honored when you know Gil asked me to yeah. to write the foreword for the book, and I'm so, certainly happy to do that, and and will be doing that, and thank want you. to make sure I deliver the, the the level of quality and standard that you'd be looking for. Thank you uh, for something like that. So something that I do take serious. Mm-hmm. Um, for the book, in terms of you know what's motivating you, what's the book about, and you know what's kind of the motivating factor behind it for you? So the book is about the need for Black Americans, not just in Memphis but across this nation, to always shape the narrative and then control that narrative, respective to where they live in the core of major uh, American cities across the country. Always shape the narrative. Imagine what your neighborhood should look like. You know, if you're just speaking to yourself or if you're speaking to you know, other brothers and sisters, you know, that should be part of the call. Imagine what you want for your neighborhood to look like, especially your neighborhood that you grew up in. Uh, you know, if you want to, you know, see it thrive consider moving back into it and I'll talk about that more in depth in a minute but overall yeah you know without losing folks you know who are uh, listening and watching because I want to be clear about where I'm going the direction overall the premise is to again have black Americans shape the narratives their respective narratives yeah for their neighborhoods and the uh, excuse me the communities and then the neighborhoods and subdivisions within them shape that narrative then control it Right. So not only have a seat at the table, but you control that table. You build it, you set it up, you put the seats around it. Right. And then you control the flow of any and every conversation about where you lay your head at night. Right. You know, and it's interesting because that's what members from other ethnic groups do. Right. And we'll also talk about that in a moment, but that's it overall. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What motivated you for that particular subject? So, yeah, you know, what was kind of your motivation behind it? Yeah. So here in Memphis, you know, we have some th- uh, social issues and problems that aren't germane to Memphis. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're prevalent in other major cities across the country, but some of them are more visible here, such as blight, such as gentrification, to the point where the oldest African American neighborhood in the country, uh, also known as Orange Mound is going to be reimagined dramatically uh, within the next 10 to 15 years, if not sooner. And that's fine, but that reimagining, that reshaping should be done by the very people who are there. Now, I know we've had some conversations offline about, well, Gil, when were communities in America ever truly, quote-unquote, black? Right. Because... You've got black flight and you have white flight. Right. Now, we talk about white flight a lot. Yeah. And then, not so much the flight of people from other ethnic groups, if you will, but the prevailing conversation around uh, xenophobia, 
and just all out fear, just all out hatred, mm-hmm. is black flight versus white flight. And, you know, folks from di- both ethnic groups committed for different reasons, you right. know, or perceived reasons. Right. You know, some reasons are actual, some are right. perceived, but they're both disingenuous. So, you know, for those coming in, to me, it just seems not sensible for those who are already there and nine times out of ten it's black folks it's not sensible for black folks to again not shape and control those narratives about what their neighborhoods the communities and neighborhoods and subdivisions within them should look like going forward if right. that makes any sense no it, it makes all, all the sense in the world yeah. and, and typically what you see in a gentrified area when gentrification comes up obviously there's the the economic um, mentality behind it or the making the economic plan behind it right. which is normally um, obviously you know business is predicated on you, you buy as low as possible and you sell as high as possible right so you know obviously every you know that everybody that understands real estate understands like you and I and many listening to this podcast and on Facebook live right. understand that um, you know ethnic groups look at a certain area and depending on the geography of the land and um, what they've priced the land at uh, however they assess the value of it and then they come in and they say okay let's come in and buy it because it's low and we can drive the value out mm-hmm. and like to your point uh, at the expense of the people that are there mm-hmm. because the people that are there sometimes are not in gen- in a generalized sense maybe not as um, astute or involved mm-hmm. in the process flow the right. legalities and the, the overall process flow to be able to defend themselves right. against decisions that are made that are not in their best interest to your point such as redlining right you know other reverse very, redlining as well and reverse redlining yeah. you know some very insidious practices that are you know manufactured <clears throat> well behind that curtain right uh, but I want to talk about two other specific prevailing thoughts very briefly yeah you know, absolutely you know, so we can keep the flow good uh, I spoke with the great uh, Mr. Sam Ballard recently. Okay. Uh, yeah. He's a phenomenal uh, champion in our city, specifically in the Promshire Park uh, community uh, on the north side of town. And I interviewed him for the book. Okay. He's provided content. And he made some very profound statements during his interview. He said, you know, Gil... When you look at how ethnic groups move, if you just want to use black flight versus white flight, or if you want to make it general, white folks, folks from the various Asian ethnic groups, be it Chinese, Korean, Vietnamese, Thai, fill in the blank, uh, Hispanic, Latino folks, again, fill in the blank as far as the ethnic group or the people from the ethnic group. When they go from point A, they keep their infrastructure when they set up at point B. Right. You know? Right. Uh, I was talking to my mom, and my father, my biological father, he's from Gary, Indiana. Mm -hmm. Even my mom remarked about how, well, baby, I remember, you know, when your dad, you know, was in his heyday and he was working uh, because he was a master carpenter, master welder. Yeah. You know, so, you know, up north, you know, see, like Gary. You know, you had those skills. You know, you were good. Yeah, you yeah, know, you were marketable. Yeah, you were sure. very marketable. But she talked about how, you know, in his middle age, there began that exodus mm-hmm. that white folks committed. You know, going to communities like Valparaiso. Right. You know, other communities close to Valparaiso and that part of Indiana. You know, at the, at the uh, south eastern tip of uh, Lake Michigan. You know, yeah. all in that area, close mm-hmm. to Chicago and whatnot. Right. Um, but to Mr. Ballard's point, you know, with my mother's, you know, giving that history, reinforcing what he had told me, you know, a couple weeks prior, you know, again, it was uh, not just a, a mass exodus, but it was an exodus with a purpose. Right. So, again, you know, whites left Gary, went to Valparaiso and those other smaller towns, and they kept their infrastructure. Mm-hmm. Chinese people do it. Vietnamese people do it. Korean people do it. Uh, again, Native Americans do it. Hispanic and Latino Americans do it. But what about us? You know, we talked about, we being Mr. Bell and I talked about how when we commit our black flight, we look to integrate versus going from point A in the case of, let's say, Orange Mound. If most folks in Orange Mound, point, case of point, 
folks from the boomer generation, that HELOC generation like we talked right, about. Right. The home equity line of credit generation. <laughs> right. You know, got a little <laughs> extra cash. Right. Oh, baby, look at this. You know, we can move over there. Right. Instead of staying here. That's what happened. You know, our great-grandparents, grandparents, they did that. Some of our parents. Right. You know, and they thought that moving to uh, areas that were predominantly white or predominantly this, predominantly that were better. But back over here, just using Orange Mountain as an example. Right. But wherever the case was, back at point A, the sense of identity was lost. The infrastructure was definitely lost. I love how you talk to me about all the time with you being uh, from Orange Mound, born and bred, how self-sustaining Orange Mound was. You literally did not have to leave Orange right. Mound. Yeah, and, 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 and I'd love to. for you to speak to that again. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, um, yeah. You, you, prior to, you know, I was born in 81. Yeah. So, that was right around the time, and there was a lot of changes in the country at that time, if you go back and read, but right. you know, through the 80s was where Orange Mound began to really turn. Right. Probably some late 70s, but most of it was the you know, 80s because of um, a lot A lot of it was due to um, the, so you got changes in the you know, economic structure, the economy changed, where factory work and warehouse work and things like that um, was outsourced and, and some of those companies closed down that um, employed a lot of men. So a lot of men from the neighborhood could work and, and earn a, a, a decent enough salary with the right skill set to support a family right. back then. And you could support a family on, you know, salaries which is today is a little more difficult. Mm-hmm. So when you lose that, um, I see a lot of men lost their sense of connection, their sense of pride, their you know um, sense of you know being a man and providing for the family. Right. Uh, at the same time, you had the government changeover where um, you had uh, Lyndon B. Johnson with the, the Great Society yeah. and all that, and, and the messaging changed to become uh, you know supporting of people being victims. Right. So the message said, you know what, it's it's a shame and it's a victim. You know you you, you know you shouldn't have had to endure this. Here's what we're going to do. You know, and he creates, you know, it enhances the welfare system and, you know, creates these other divisions within it that ultimately created economic benefit for men and women to not unite and right. become together. Right. When you create division amongst men and women, um, that has detrimental uh, impact, um, you know, and, and kind of neg- negative um you know, uh, disparate treatment to the community, um, and the impact was widespread. That people, um, when you, you know, there's not that connectivity and that unity, people begin to not trust each other. Yeah. And when you lose the trust, and you, you know, women lose trust in men, men lose trust in women, and when the government begins subsidizing um, some of what the man used to provide, right, um, that's going to create a national, a natural kind of division through it. Um, and then, you know, kind of the, the third thing was the drug trade, of course, that yeah. came up, um, you know, from Lamar. Southern Tip, you know, came up Lamar, um, actually all the way down from um, Mexico. And that came up through there. And so, you know, as that trade came through and it kind of settled there, so you had the perfect storm of um, kind of, you know, desperate men who no longer had a way to support their family. Um, so how do you self-medicate some of those pains and some of those ills? What you saw across the country, which right. was drugs in right. neighborhoods. And it became less self-sufficient. And then as the city began to expand, so if you micro that down to Memphis, the city then expands to where now there's access. So you come out of the civil rights movement where people got leery. Um, and this, some of this is my opinion. Some of this is what you know. You read is that right. people begin to le- leery in those later years. Um, there were um, the government had different. Um, some people call it conspiracies, but you know there were different uh, organ. You know, kind of um, uh, covert kind of plans that went into yeah, Quintel Pro. Yeah, Quintel Pro and right. some of those that um, were um, designed to um, illegally survey and. Um, you know, uh, oversee certain political groups and things like that that they thought, quote unquote, was a threat. Some of that led to assassinations, and you think of Fred Hammond, Hamden, Hampton, and that kind of thing. Um, you know, it. So all those things kind of created that perfect storm, that the beginning of. Then you started having, you know, flight because once you had the integration, those that were astute enough 
that could see, that could survey the land and have a holistic enough view said, okay, I can go over here. I don't have to deal with what I have to deal with over here. And I can go over here because that's faster than me fixing where I'm at. Right. You know, because, you know, it's, it's kind of like, you know, what people say even in the NBA. Take LeBron off the Cleveland Cavaliers and... You got J.R. Smith, you know. <laughs> Whatever J.R. Smith was thinking last night. You guys night. are giving J.R. Yeah, yeah. Think uh, about, hard uh, time, man. Think about LeBron wasn't even on the floor with his 51 points. <laughs> That's the thing. So man. so you, so if you use that as an analogy and you say, okay, yeah. um, you know, it's what Kevin Durant did. So think of the other side. All right, how long is it going to take for me to win here in Oklahoma City with Russell Westbrook? Or can I go over here? Which was a with, super team, actually. Well, you it know? was. A, I mean, they had the Warriors and, what th- up three one. Yeah, and and, and to stay on, on topic and, and keep the, the analogy relative to right. gentrification. Yeah, if you look at that team before Kevin left Oklahoma City, seventy three wins. Yeah, yeah. Now you're referring to the Warriors. Yeah, I'm referring to the Warriors. But so. that Thunder team. The Thunder team won 60-something games, too, and had the Warriors up 3-1. A powerful Serge Ibaka, a James Harden coming into his own. Yeah, okay, so yeah, prior to that, yeah. Russ, you know, you have Brody, KD. So think about that. So many black folks are quick to leave our communities, but they don't even realize that there are still gems within the communities. Now... Are a lot of black communities underserved? Absolutely. Sure. But there are still some redeemable, I don't want to say qualities, but redeemable assets right. in terms of infrastructure that are still available. But because of what's around those, you mm-hmm. know, and then to make the connection with the analogy of Kevin leaving Oklahoma City to go to Oakland. Right. The patience isn't there. You know, like you say, how long am I going to have to wait? How long am I going to have to wait on this grant? How long am I going to have to wait on this uh, traffic camera? How long am I going to have to wait on these speed bumps? You know, like you're saying, okay, how long, you know, is Russ going to develop into a pass-first point guard instead of shooting first? You look at it from a micro level. So at a very micro micro level to yourself, you say, okay, Yes, it would be great if me and everybody else stayed around and learned to win together and things like that. Yeah. The challenge with that is if you're Kevin Durant, and then this is how people in the community think, is I'm not going to be able to play basketball for 40 years right? Right at the NBA level. Right. I've already been in the NBA 10 years. Mm-hmm. So I've got more basketball behind me than in front of me. Right. And that's how people you know think even in the community. So they said, okay. I want to win a championship. I, I'm not confident I'm going to be able to do it here. So I can become Charles Barkley, Reggie Miller, Patrick Ewing, everybody, John Stock, everybody that never, Carmelo, everybody that never, the greats that never won a title. I can be in that category, or I can go and win a title with the caveat that, sure, people are going to bust me up in the uh, uh, now. But 15 years from now, when everybody's kind of forgotten about it to the most part, for the most part, I'll be reveled as a champion right. and revered as a champion. Right. And so people, that's that cataclysm that people kind of face is, I think most people at their core want to be able to help the community. But they look at it and they say, look at all the ills. And it's, it's not just what you see. You know, you know, you have economic slavery and you have a, a depressed mindset. Mm-hmm. That's what's difficult. It's just like and the they, biohazards too. Right. You know, blight. You know, blight is more prevalent here in Memphis, right. in my opinion. That's just my personal opinion. But blight is exacerbated here. I think it's exacerbated by the fact that so many of us are leaving out. And I'm going to get to that very specifically. Sure. Uh, as a part of my call to action, it's not a plan. Mr. Yeah. Bullard and I talked about that too, because there's so many plans out here. Right. But how many of them are being executed? That's why I just left what I have a call to action. Yeah. But. But go ahead. Yeah, no. So, you know, th- that's really what, you know, ends up coming. So people have that Kevin Durant mentality. Right. They do it with the job all the time. Right. Like, like how many people, like people that slam Kevin Durant? I guarantee you there, there are people, whether they're on Facebook or listen to this podcast, that if 
the, the the company across the street offer a dollar more per hour. They don't like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Twenty five cents. I used to have when I was in banking. I had tellers that left fifty cents an hour. <laughs> Deuces, Ron. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. And they go run to the bank across the street. Yeah. 50 cents an hour. Yeah. He left, he took supposedly less money, but to go win. Right. And so that's what people will do is they'll go where the infrastructure is already built out. Mm-hmm. It's like, what I'm trying to build over here, they already have. Mm-hmm. And I'm not going to have another chance to be able to go over there. But here's so the thing. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, so if you put that as in the same fashion okay. of, you know. What's going on? Um, if, if you if you think of that in the same you know in terms of the timing piece of it, and I right. say okay, you know, I've got to be able to do that. Right. I, you know, I, I want to be able to win, and I don't see it with this type of mentality right. that they're going to be able to do it. You know, I'm limited on when I can do it, so I've got to make the move now. Otherwise, I'm never going to be able to make it. But here's the thing: unfortunately, and unlike the NBA. When we're talking about black communities, right? When that's done collectively, we lose control. Right. So Kevin didn't lose any control by going from Oklahoma City to Oakland mm-hmm. to play for the Warriors and going to win uh, very soon with maybe three titles. You know, where's the control being lost? You know, well, how's he, control being lost versus he how, lost some control with his narrative because then some of the writers and people that do the voting for the Hall of Fame and all that they're holding that against him because they're saying, well, you you left when well, you had a team up three one, they won seventy three games, the most games in history, and you leave to join that team, right? And somewhat shift the balance of power, you know, within the confines of the NBA, right? You're, I agree with you. I think that. Um, you know, it, it's not the same impact mm-hmm. in terms of we're using it as an analogy, right. or grossly, but right. um, it's not the same type of impact. But people use that same mentality. Yeah. They say, "Yeah, I'll be slandered for leaving South Memphis and going to Cardiville, mm-hmm. but you know, am I going to sit here on South Parkway and wait for this to change?" And everybody, because a lot of people, like you said, a lot of people have plans. A lot of people want to go do stuff, and then it's the execution. Right. So it could be a hundred of us that all want to see this all better, but they're not willing to implement the plan for a number of reasons. That could be legit. They don't have the education. They don't have the skill set. They don't have the connections. Um, they're not available because they have to survive. They're, they're at work all the time. They have to survive. Whatever the, the reason is. But So they say... And this is no knock on South Memphis. This is right. no knock on Carterville or, or any area that's mentioned in this podcast. We're not knocking it at all. We're just giving the thought mentality that hopefully people can relate to. Um, but so you go to Carterville and you say, okay, way less crime, um, way less of people who look like me. Although there's there's a good number of people out there that do look like me, but the infrastructure is already in place. So that the things that are the social ills, and this is what one of the questions I want to ask you, which is. Um, and people use this term, you know, devil's advocate and all that. And I see a lot of he's got a lot of advocates, so I, I don't need to. <laughs> I don't need to add to it. I'm sure he's got a number. fans too. Yeah, I'm sure he's got a net number of advocates. But um, <laughs> just to provide a, a contrasting view to this, um, what are your thoughts, Gil, on when people say? And I walk you through kind of a scenario into my question. Sure. So you have, um, you know. Uh, you know, John and and uh, you know Toya, yeah, they're gonna be shot. Anybody named John and Toya, they say no, not gonna be. You know, I'll get an inbox from somebody named John and right. Toya. Like, yeah. yeah. So no, so you take John and Toya. They they both grew up in the neighborhoods and stuff. Um, they go to school. They fight their claw their way through school. Yada yada. They get their break, right? Uh, one or both of them gets a nice paying job, or the business takes off. And so now they're making the kind of money, then they have children. And they say, okay, here in Memphis, um, you know, know, where do we want to live to be able to grow our family? And they they decide on Germantown. So they move and they they buy a $325,000 house in Germantown, Gil. And they're out there. And they say, you know, now Mama and Grandma, everybody still lives in South Memphis, right? And Westwood and some different area. They, so they still live there. Most of their family still lives there. They go visit them from time to time. You know, they might help watch their kids. Um, they go there for the cookouts, the family reunions, and all. Uh, yeah. And then, of course, at the end of the day, when they're done with all that, 
they go back to Carryville. Um, that family comes visit them in Carryville every now and then when they can. But that's their life. And they may say, we'd love to be able to go back. They may even own rental property in the area where they grew up. Right. Um, so they, they that's their way of kind of giving back is, let me create affordable housing or let me um, renovate yeah, housing and, and help the blight situation. Now, I'm not going to go back there myself because... I've got my nice 3,000 square foot home in Carrierville that I don't have to worry about some of the behavior mindset ills that I see in my old neighborhood where I grew up. And my children don't have to see that either. Right? And so there's this balance, and sometimes they have this conflict like, yeah, I'll go back to South Memphis and I'll own rental property, right? And I'll, you know, I'll charge someone $800 a month to rent this house and I'll earn the income and I'm helping out the community. But going back may be out the question. For a comfort, it may be both of them don't don't see a value in doing that. It may be one, like a spouse, you know, say the wife says, you know, the husband says, yeah, I'd, I'd be willing to go back to South Memphis. There are a few nice sized houses and things like that. No, he says, no, we, you know, we worked our asses off to get out here, you know, John. And I'm not sending my child to fill in the blank school. And I'm not. You know, going out there, there's no Target, there's no Walmart, there's no, you know what I mean? There's no this or that. Yeah. Right? The grocery store is, you know, eight miles down the street. And, you know, I would have so, so several rebuttals. Thought? Yeah, so what would be your rebuttal? I would have several. One of them is the fact that resources are being allocated in unincorporated parts of counties where major metropolitan areas are. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're also being less allocated to uh, parts of suburbs that uh, have not been uh, rezoned for annexation right. uh, by major metropolitan areas. Case in point, right here in Memphis. And I think Cordova is the prime example of how uh, encroachment uh, is more prevalent there. You know, you have you know, some considerable parts of Cordova in which roads don't have lights. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, my best friend was telling me about how where he lives in Cordova, which is deep in Cordova, you right. know, deep uh, east-northeast, there are no street lights on his road uh, for a considerable portion of it. Uh, that He and his wife, their garbage may get picked up every three to four days. Maybe a little longer, and I'm not too familiar with the pickup schedule out there, but it's definitely not consistent with the average pickup schedule, you know, in other parts of the city. Yeah, because that part of Cordova is now Memphis proper. Right. You know, again, it's uh, one of those uh, reserve areas, mm-hmm. if you will. Right. You know, some of the areas in, in Germantown uh, and other suburbs, but it's definitely you know one of those reserve areas. And, you know, it's been annexed by city government officials, but you don't see, again, the allocation of services. So, again, you know, that they're paying for. That they're paying for. Right. And that is one of the mistakes that black folks make. Well, I'm going to go all the way out here and escape, but you're not because government officials see what's going on. Mm -hmm. Okay. They see that we are continuing to, to flee, to fly. You know, to the suburbs and, right. you know, even uh, to parts un- unknown almost, right. you know, in large numbers. And I don't think, unfortunately, that trend uh, is going to stop anytime soon, that specific trend of black flight. Uh, but as more white people come back into uh, the core of major cities, uh, you know, with that comes what? And it's not always about because people are white or people are Native American or people are Hispanic, Latino or Asian American. It's not always about that. Mm-hmm. But, you know, government officials look at, okay, whether it's not necessarily census data, but, you know, just at a micro level as we talk about mm-hmm. uh, increases in population per square mile, right. you know, that city planners look at. So, you know, you're veteran city planner may look at a report and say wow okay in Berkeley, in this subdivision in 2010 within a square mile radius there were 4,890 people right now it's projected that in 20 
15, there's going to be a population within that same one mile square radius of about 8,000. Hmm. So if we've got more people moving in this section of Berkeley, we have to somehow allocate more resources. And that didn't just happen or even start with the city planner. You know, right. we both know that. But of course, city planners have their hand on that largely, right? Right. Or hands, rather. So... You know, that, that's the mistake that a lot of black folks are making, thinking, well, I'm going to get away. Yeah. But you're running to where there are less resources, but more resources are being allocated in the city. You mentioned Westwood. Mm-hmm. There's something else that black folks need to do. We need to do. Not just shape and control the narratives of what we want our neighborhoods to look like, but also know the narratives are already in place. Know about projects that are already on the table. Yeah. I'll give you one prime one, Resilient Shelby. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, the Shelby County government received last year, I believe, $60 million from the federal government to do what in Westwood? Flood remediation. You know, you look at the neighborhoods or the communities, specifically Riverview, uh, French Fort is a little more... It's a little more, yeah, to the... Yeah, to the... Yeah, I mean, it's... North? Yeah. Slightly, it's, the northwest. Yeah, and closer to the river. And closer yeah. to the river. But yeah. but flooding doesn't occur in French Fort, not even close to the Riverview community, uh, the majority of Westwood. And flood remediation is being done, but not just flood remediation. You're going to have new greenscapes. Uh, you're going to have, uh, you know, uh, more revitalization of... Uh, streetscapes, mm-hmm. uh, added greenscapes, I should say, and revitalization of streetscapes. You're going to have more uh, resources injected into Westwood because of what's coming. Right. You know, and that's coming over the next five to ten years. But again, Westwood is one of the communities where you know, a lot of black folks say, I don't think I can build here anymore. But that's not what other people are thinking, and other people with big money, with right. big dollars. Right. That's what well, they know what's what, coming down the and, pipeline. And that's what happens with the cycle is that you, know, you have one flight that's followed by the other flight. Exactly. And that's where I think to your earlier point makes sense is we've got to be able to settle different areas and, like you say, keep the same infrastructure. So right. if you if you have Orange Mound and you leave to go and you find some land out in Piperton or something or, or wherever and you build that up, Orange Mount shouldn't suffer from that. Exactly. But that's exactly what happens because a lot of times we don't quite have the same level of resources and family wealth to maintain that. Right. So your, your family's, your, you know, you're your top heavy sometimes in your family. Yeah. And that's what, because we still have a lot of first generation, it's not just about college and things like that, but you right. got a lot of first generation critical thinkers, mm-hmm. you know, and... That's you know something that takes time to, to kind of catch up. But yeah. You mentioned earlier about uh, the unincorporated Cordova area, and I'll share with you kind of some of the rebuttal that you might get from people with that, which is that's true of the unincorporated areas, but those are kind of far and few between. But the people who live in um, city of Germantown, city of Carrierville, city of Bartlett, city of Millie, what, you know, whatever the city is, they have those resources. And... The other thing is that what most people will say that are in that situation, they'll say, okay, Gil or Ron, um, not having streetlights is different than me getting shot in the head. That's different than the same brother that I'm trying to help comes and breaks in my house while I'm there or while my wife's there or while my girlfriend's there or while well, my kids are there. That's different than... Um, I look outside and the brother I'm trying to help is dumping tires in my backyard and I can't get him to stop. And I call the police and, you know, all this kind of thing. So the ills that they feel like don't exist out there, because I I, I challenge anybody to go dump any tires anywhere in Germantown. (laughs) I I challenge you. Matter of fact, um, let me know you did it. (laughs) So... And uh, record it for me. The tire dump challenge. Yeah, yeah. Again, hashtag tire dump and jump. <laughs> I guarantee, and see what happens. Yeah, and it's not. It's because it's not so much that the authorities police it. So it's not like you go do something in an area and the authorities just gonna be sitting there waiting and watching. Right. It's the people. Right. You know, the first thing to do that any man or woman there that sees you doing that mm-hmm. is going to chastise that, and yeah. they're going to then get that to the authorities yeah. to have it addressed. Well, let me jump back in. And so, but because. I have another rebuttal yeah. for those folks. Yeah, definitely. And it's in the form of an example that you and I take pride in sharing when we met Duke 
Right. In Orange Mound. So I'd love for you to expound on that. Yeah. yeah. So Gil and I, we were looking at a property to, to rehab a duplex in Orange Mound. And um, we, we came across, there was a young brother that walked by. He was in his... Uh, he was probably 22, 23, yeah, something Yeah, very there. early 20s. Yeah. yeah. Grew up in the area. And so, we, you know, we stopped him and just start, started kind of chatting with him. And he shared with us that he grew up in that area. That the house that Gil and I were looking at investing in had been blight his whole life. From the time that he was a child, he remembers no one was in this house. And it was just kind of a blighted house. So you're talking about someone that's 22, 23 years old that remembers a house from their youth. Right. So that tells you that... There just hasn't been the level of investment right. in the community for a house to sit for twenties. You know, be you know, let's just call it fifteen years. Right. If it's old enough for him to remember, yeah. let's just say it's anywhere from ten to fifteen years. So it's just been sitting there. Minimum. Minimum. Right. So what we did, and, and my approach has always been, um, anytime I go into community and invest, whether I'm I'm purchasing a property or rehab, whatever I do, I try to connect with the people that are there um, for a few reasons. One. Um, they tend to become good advocates, yep. you know, obviously for what you're doing. Mm-hmm. Um, they tend to welcome it. You're able to involve them. And it's not about you being bigger than them or, or you know, how you're this to them. Because yeah, you, you you go with people and you're looking at them eye to eye. So as a man, we talk to you and we said, here's what we're thinking about doing. Um, you're, you're here. You know, let's work together. Right. And, you know, let's work together to be able to help rehab something like this. The way you can help is... You can, you know, inform us of, you know, what's going on and, um, you know, alert us to things that are changing or anybody that might try to impact it or damage the house or things like that. You know, let us know about that. Right. So you build a relationship with them. You're not just coming in like blah, 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 this and I'm this and you're that. And, you know, like these developers who come in. Exactly. What you're doing is you're coming in as I level with the brother and saying, man, here's. You know, here's what we're, we're thinking about doing, what we're looking to do. What can you share with us about some of the history on it? And he was great at doing that. He was. And I've been able to communicate with him because, you know, anything that has anything to do with that property, he's texting me. Like, oh, man, we saw this dude doing this, or you know, we saw this, and we were looking out for the, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. he's just, he's a good brother, a good kid. Right. And... You know, sharing some things with him and some things that he can work on to, you know, help improve his situation, things yeah. like that, to be a resource for him. So it's a, it's a, it's a two lane street. But yeah, so but yeah, so he's so that would be one of, of several examples that I would uh, share with you know folks in their ivory towers in Germantown and Bartlett and right. certain parts of Cordova and Arlington and Lakeland and fill in the blank. And unfortunately, this is a reality, and I, I want to go off course very quickly get right back on but we live in america we live in a violent country so harm can come to any of us anytime anywhere due to the the reluctance of our federal government to make widespread sweeping reform in regard to gun control right so many other factors make this reality the stark reality that it is. So just because you're in Germantown, it doesn't make you invincible. It doesn't make you uh, or your respective subdivision impenetrable. You know, I mean, we're still in America, and there's things that we have to deal with in terms of uh, public and personal safety. Now, again, at the micro level, right. to keep everything, you know, sensible. Of course, are black communities underserved or many black communities underserved? Yes, but with the example that Ron and I just shared with everyone, there are so many young brothers and sisters who just want an opportunity to have ownership. And right. that's one of the points that I have in my call to action. When you provide ownership to young brothers and sisters who are looking for it, and of course you, you can't be fearful, you right. can't be apprehensive, you know, you have to lead at the tip of the spear and say, you know what? I'm going to take a chance and give this young brother, this young sister, opportunity to have not just an engagement with me, but going past the engagement, an opportunity to lead. And I can talk about that very briefly at the very end, but uh, I did want to get back to two prevailing thoughts with Mr. Sam Bullard. I I love Mr. Bullard. That that guy is awesome. Yeah. Uh, (laughs) He said a lot of things that are going to make a lot of folks mad, or would make a lot of folks mad. (laughs) Right. I'm telling you, he's... 
he would step on some toes. But first point, it's in the form of a quote. It was powerful. He said, Gil, the consequence of white flight is the relocation of a white community from one location to another. So the consequence is the relocation of a white community. The consequence of black flight is the disintegration of a black community. And when you look, when you look across, where's the lie? I dare anyone to find the lie in that. You right. know, to all, all our friends and acquaintances and colleagues watching and listening, find the lie in, in that quote. Find the lie. Now, is it debatable? It can be up for debate. You know, well, it's, I, it's I, not gospel. Yeah, no, it's not gospel. But, but I would say that there, there's truth to it because when, when we leave, because and the reason we have that is because we disintegrate to go integrate. Exactly. Right. When other ethnic groups don't have that desire, yeah, they want to keep the cohesiveness. They want to keep the connectivity. Yeah, they just go integrate somewhere else. They keep right. the integration. They go integrate somewhere else. Right. Some of that again is because they understand that when you own your means of production, you know, which means you own your economics and you own your politics. Yes. Because um, I've always said this, and you know, I haven't been challenged on it once, but I welcome it. Is you've got to own your own, you know, politics. Your politicians have to be hired by you, they, but they work for the people. It's not just because you go vote. You've got to put the resources behind them, and you put them in place. You can't have like in in our community you get people that see it as an opportunity for a job, like right. a pension. Right. So they run, and then you get. 10 different dudes and 10 different girls running for one position, splitting up the votes and everything, and then somebody jumps in and snatches it. So you, you, what you got to do is what they, what other ethnic groups do, which is they come in and they say, okay, Ron, you're, you're our guy. Okay, we're going to put all our resources behind you. Here's your agenda. All right? If you do not follow this agenda, we will you'll get rid of you. And we will put someone else there. But here's the agenda. Right? And so that's what they do. They put people in their agenda. We don't do that. We just kind of... And then we just vote over and over again for people because of popularity and being fearful of any change. Right. Although we say we want change. But when we go in the voting booth and when we, we go around and we, we operate right. with our dollars and cents, with our attention, it doesn't match our mouth or our post. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah, def- that's definitely post. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, the, you know, you right. know their, their actions, their mouth, and their post don't all jive together. Right. You know what I mean? And right. so they don't, they don't marry. Right. And that's where you have the disintegration, I think, mm-hmm. because of that. Yeah. Um, because, it's, you know, when, when you do own your own means of production, it's easy to attract others because you then have the infrastructure. Right. So, you, you, you know, you can go to the court. And, and you can put up your own goal. Yeah, and I but think until you have the ball, and I think that's what we were yeah. getting at with the analogy with, ball. with KD going from OKC to Oakland. Mm-hmm. It, the means of production, he was going to increase not just only his means of production, but his opportunity to win a championship. But when we disintegrate, the likelihood of us having any level of a means of production is. You know, dramatically reduce. Right. So, yeah, I, I wanted that to be clear in that yeah. analogy we were making. Yeah, definitely. Um, no, that's a good point. Yeah, but quickly, the second prevailing theme coming from, or prevailing thought rather, coming from Mr. Ballard is that, you know, he talked about how, you know, our our uh, our warriors, our, our our elders from, you know, that baby boomer generation, <laughs> that that HELOC generation. Right. You know, and to make it unique to Memphis, how. You know, older folks who graduated from Manassas back in the day, BTW back in the day, mm-hmm. uh, you know, Hamilton back in the day. Right. You know, you fill in the blank. You know, they're proud of the communities they came from. Right. But they don't want to go back. It's like, oh, yeah, Orange Mound, you know, South Memphis, you know, fill in the blank of, of, with any community that's, you know, in South Memphis, geographically speaking. Right. You know, North North, you know. Uh, you know Douglas or right. Smoky City, you know Binghampton. You know, fill in the blank. They're still proud. They have that pride, but they're not about to you know rush in. Well, and a lot of that pride sometimes is geared in ego and bravado. Right. So right. that's the center of it. So we, we uh, particularly with the men, it tends to be used as as essentially to equate that um, 
you know, I, you know, I'm bad, I'm big, I'm tough because I'm from there. Right. 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 Because I'm from fill in the blank. Right. Neighborhood. Even or though block the, or, even though there's no kryptonite there, there's no vibranium. You know. It's <laughs> Even though they don't own any piece of it, right? Don't even own it, right? Own so they're prideful yeah. of things, right. and it's like like Jigga said, you know, they don't even own, you know, Mama don't even own her own lot, right? Don't even own where she lives, right? You don't own where you live, right? But you have pride in the area that you don't own <laughs> and land that you own, you know. Right. It's just like you go down to Wolf Chase Mall and you just stand in front of it like you're proud. <laughs> Man, look at this. You know what I mean? Look at, you know, look at this Chili's, right. Right. you know. Barnes and Noble, right? Starbucks, yeah, Cheddar's, yeah, yeah, cheese. Yeah, look factory. at all this that I've got. You know, I'm, I'm from Cheddar's, man. You can't, you can't mess with me, Maybe man. Silly, man. You know, what, you know what we do to people, man. If you from Chili's, man, you can't come over the Cheddar's, right? Right. Do you know right, what I mean? Right. You know right. what I mean? We we don't serve them folks, man. Right. We from Cheddar's, and we throw up our seeds. You know what I mean? We do our little dance, and that's our pride in it. Right. You know what I mean? Right. But we don't. <laughs> You know what I mean, but we don't own any piece of it. Right. So you see how silly that sounds. Right. right. But that's how we are. Right. And so what happens? And you see this around. And don't get me wrong. Personally, I don't find it to be uh, hilarious or uh, foolish for anyone to have pride in our actual community. No. But again, to Ron's great points, you know, ownership. Yeah. The, the pride should transition right. into. Um, what are you doing there? Because right. you know, as another thing that people do, particularly with schools, is you know they they shout out their school, they have pride in their school, they won't send their kids there. Exactly. You know what I mean? It's weird. You see that, like you know, take you know, and I don't want to start shouting school. You know, people would get upset, but you know, like when they were going to shut down Carver, right? You know, folks shout out Carver or they shout out whatever school, but then they send their kids to the White Station. Right. They send their kids to. Some other school in some other area. Yeah, but you know, and, again, and, and there's some reason. There's some legit reason for that because yeah. your know, areas change and things yeah, like that. So but not, you know. but we've used BTW as an example. BTW is a hell of a school. Oh yeah, no truth doubt. be told. Yeah, you know, so uh, yeah, you know, the this cloud that's over it at times. You know, it's not and the just one example problem. we got where we have kind of stayed somewhat, even though this wasn't an area that was originally um, predominantly you know black, is Whitehaven. Right, you know, you know, Whitehaven, which you know, you know, most census studies will tell you that is, um, the, you know, that zip code to three eight one one six and kind of around there is um, one of the more wealthy zip codes, if not the wealthiest in yep. the in the county. Absolutely. Um, and and so there's a lot of people who stay there. That's one of the ways that it, it stayed wealthy was, you know, people moved there in the sixties and you know, mostly in the seventies, and they stayed. Right? right, so they you know they've been there now going on fifty years, so they paid off their house. Right, so they don't have quite the income, but they don't have the debt. Say like exactly. a Germantown does, where you know the average house price is in the three hundred and fifty thousand dollar range or whatever it is. Don't quote me, but um, so people have a lot more debt. They may have a higher income, so you may have six figure income. Right, but now you've got younger kids and you've got more debt. Right, and. Whereas someone in Whitehaven who bought their house way back when, and for the most part, has paid that off. So, you know, there's some different dynamics with that, but, yeah, I mean. Right, yeah. So I'm, I'm interested to know if we've got some engagement on the thread, if anyone has any questions or comments. or. Yeah, so feel free if you're on the Facebook Live. Those are listening to the podcast. We're on Facebook Live on the Mind of Your Business podcast page. And, and for me, Champ Ron, uh, my guest again is Gil Carter, the founder of the First Year Foundation Incorporated, joining us and giving us you know great content. But if you happen to be on Facebook Live right now, uh, y'all feel free, man, to uh, comment if you've got questions, if you agree, disagree, um, whatever it is, if you've got a contrasting point. Uh, definitely share that, but let, so we've kind of aired out some of the ills of you know, and, and kind of looked at things within the neighborhood and things like that. Gil, let's get into the solution. All right, yeah. So let's do that. You know, because um, you know we, you know, it, you know, always you know, let's talk about you know, we most people with reason plans don't get implemented is because we spend all day talking about the ills and right. talking about the issues right. and things like that. But um, so, what would you say you know is a solution to attracting? Say suburban blacks and things like that back into inner cities with the idea of investing and providing that um, thought process towards the means of production. Well, you just mentioned one of the tangibles investment and how many of us can take advantage of being landowners in some cases for the very first time. 
Yeah. Uh, you know, land can't be manufactured. Right. Yeah, they're not growing no more land. Right, yeah. <laughs> I mean, we're, 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 it's over with in that right. regard. So, you know, to be able to purchase, you know, lots, whether, of course, uh, through the Shelby County Land Bank, uh, also through uh, the Land Bank of Memphis, I believe that's the the private entity uh, mm-hmm. in which you know folks can acquire land. But ownership is so key. Ownership right. is so key. And again, like the example I gave, you know, of what's going to happen in Westwood, uh, that's exciting. Mm-hmm. You know, because again. You know, once that flood remediation is completed and other improvements are made, uh, you know, property values are going to skyrocket. You know, yeah, uh, a lot of blight is going to be eliminated. But go, go ahead. Yeah, but you know, to add to that, I guess you know, to, to add a little bit more meat to my question is, yeah. how do you get the family of four or five or maybe even six, but mostly four or five, that's out in Germantown, that's out in Bartlett, that's out in Cordova, you know? Olive Branch, wherever. How, you know, how, what would have to happen to entice them to say, you know what, we're going to sell our home here and go back, you know, to this community and still feel confident that the ills that we talked about earlier have either been resolved and are in a serious process of being resolved. And I can contribute to helping resolve that because the big thing is, is like say, people perceive it as. You know, I've worked hard. You know, I shouldn't have to. I shouldn't have to put bars on my windows to keep my own people from coming in. I don't have to do that out here because well, I don't have to worry about well, first of those all, folks well, doing that. Well, so they, how do you get them to do that? Well, they necessarily have to sell their house. You know, in this day and age where yeah. you've got Airbnb, you have uh, uh, another uh, service. Uh, yeah, uh, I can't think of the name of it. It's through Hilton. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think you know what I'm, what yeah, I'm, I know what you're talking trying about. to think of, but you know, where you can have residual cash flow coming in every month. Uh, also, uh, with the ability, you know, to just get involved, you know, to, to answer your question, to give more meat to my response. Yeah, I want to make it threefold. One, the fact that they wouldn't necessarily have to sell their house, right, wherever they are now. Two. Working to develop a sense of you know organic pride, a sense of organic you know connectivity, especially for you know those who have uh, moved on, you know brothers and sisters who you know have become very successful, uh, you know well healed, and decided to move out, but you know have the the means to come back in, and not just come back in for the sake of coming back in, but to you know, again, have that pride in helping the communities come back. Right. You know, and number three, I know schools is big. Yeah. You know, now, personally, I don't have any children, so I can understand how the specific uh, issue for brothers and sisters who are apprehensive about coming back into our communities is schools. Uh, and I'm not going to use a comparison of, you know, schools in which, you know, horrific tragedies have taken place. I don't want to do that because I, I do feel that'd be a bit disingenuous and a little insensitive. But, you know, again, we mentioned BTW. I mean, that's a that's a top school. But there are many, you know, many of the and, schools and, and, that people perceive as being one way right. really aren't. Right, it, they but most people, they just live off the perception, right, to your point. Right. They, they've never walked a day in the school, mm-hmm. you know. Um, and so they don't know. They just look at the area around it. They watch the news and things like that. And they just think, well, that's how it is, and that's how it is all the time. Right. But until you actually walk in, you don't really know. So, you know, I'll add to kind of what you're saying. Um, what, what I would offer up as a solution would be is you've got to be able to begin organizing it. And it's, it's not an overnight kind of process, but what you've got to be able to do is start um, organizing in that area and start, um, uh, from a collaborative standpoint, start um, unifying the resources and let people see that so that um, people don't feel like they're on an island. Because some people may sit in, in Carryville, Germantown somewhere and say, I'd love to go back, but just one me is not going to change all of that. Right? right. But, you know, however, um, if we come in an organized fashion and begin addressing the infrastructure, then we can't, we will make a difference right. in that. And so, you know, we're social beings. 
And so if we, if, if it was to get organized to be able to go back. So use Orange Mountain as an example. If you said, listen, we want to go back to Orange Mountain. No, Orange Mountain's exi- existing infrastructure isn't two and three car garage, all brick home, 3,500 square feet, you know, you know, uh, crown molding everywhere homes, right? That's yeah. not what the existing infrastructure Even though a mile away, that is part of the existing, existing right. infrastructure is, of Cooper Young. Right, exactly. Yeah, we're talking um, a mile. Well, and not even as much Cooper you Young. Know, in, you, in pockets. Yeah, in pockets. Yeah. yeah. Most of it is if you go um, just over the tracks to Southern, where you go into by the University of Memphis area, right. up towards Central, right. where you start having the bigger homes yeah. and things like that, which yeah. is still about a mile away. Right. Um, because even when I was young, you know, we used to play on the tracks right there at Southern, and then you had the golf course mm-hmm. right there, which they were always making sure we didn't come anywhere near the damn <laughs> golf course. You know, they didn't want us anywhere near. Right. Right? And, um, <laughs> but, you know, so, yeah, so that would, the whole idea would be is if you can pool those folks together and the resources so that you can go back in and begin to make that kind of uh, monetary and social investment in it, right. not in a sense of, and, and this is some of the challenge too, is you can't go do the same thing that other ethnic groups do when they gentrify. So you can't have this almost reverse gentrification where astute black folk come back in and gentrify themselves. Gotcha, without the buy-in of the other right. brothers and sisters who so are already there. Brothers and sisters, you know, away right, right. out of their own community and essentially become what what they despise. Right, right. right. So, well, you know what? To, to add even more meat, yeah. uh, I know we talked about me only mentioning the first two points of the call to action, but let me go ahead and read them all. No, yeah, please. Yeah, yeah so, let's add that in so people... Yeah, so this is the major response to your question. And again, this is a call to action. This isn't a so-called plan. It's not gospel. It's not a manifesto. Okay? It's just a call. Right. You know, you guys may hear this and say, well, Gil... I'm only in a place in my life with the capacity that I have to only do point one. Well, do point one and then work to be able to do two and three. And then the next thing you know, you're doing all five. Right. All right. Do what you can do. So point one is to challenge black brothers and sisters who have the economic, political and or social capital to move into predominantly black and underserved communities. Point two is to encourage black brothers and sisters who currently live within predominantly black and underserved communities to develop immeasurable amounts of community-based accountability, ownership, and pride. Mm -hmm. The example of this, again, is what Ron and I did when we met Duke in Orange Mound that day. Right. Point number three is to control the community narratives. Point number four is to make strategic, personal, and professional capital investments. And point number five is to promote environmental sustainability. Now, I want to hop on five for a minute because that's very specific. What's happening, in particular, on the north side of town is that so many communities, and Douglas is a prime example of this, Mm -hmm. how companies and corporations look at the lack of engagement by our brothers and sisters, and they say, well, you know what? If they're not going to take ownership, if they're not going to take pride, if they're not going to take accountability for their later heads... This is what we'll do as a corporation. We'll just make it a dumping ground. Right. And for anyone who's living in Memphis for any extended period of time, going up Chelsea, going past Hollywood with those uh, plants are over there and uh, those two rail yards. Well, it's one rail yard, mm-hmm. uh, but that rail yard and those plants over there, uh, the odors are atrocious by what's coming or what's being uh, produced by processes that are facilitated at those plants, mm-hmm. you know, but that's all in a residential area, you know, right. except for, you know, of course, the lot that's zoned for the plants, you know, for the, the structures, Right. but it's still in the middle of a residential area, specifically Douglas. All that is very close to the Douglas community, which in terms of infrastructure and specifically community pride and ownership, mm-hmm. you have a lot of folks in the Douglas community who are staunch supporters of their school children. Star supporters of community-based initiatives that are over there, but you've got this elephant in a room of a lack of environmental sustainability, illegal dumping, etc. So, number five is big to me. You know, I'm, I'm all about 
uh, protecting the environment. You know, as far as we know, we only have one planet to live on. You know, but it starts within our backyards. And a lot of backyards on the north side of town in Memphis, you know, are not too green. So those are my five points as a part of my call to action. And again, I want for people to understand, Ron. Yeah. I want for brothers and sisters in particular to understand, just do what you can do. Right. Just do, can, do what you can do with the capacity that you have mm-hmm. at, at this point in your life. Wherever you are in your life station, do what you can do. Yeah. But, but we have to control the narratives. We have to shape the narratives first, then control them going forward. And that, yeah. again, going back to my overall premise for the book. Yeah, definitely. And so those are points that are going to be brought and manifested into the book that yeah. you'll bring out and, right. and things like that. So speaking of the book, you know, when can they expect you know, the book to be ready? I know folks are itching to be able to get their hands on it and kind of check out the content. So well, I'm looking what can they expect? I'm looking to drop it next year. Okay. Uh, you know, I want to cut my teeth with... Uh, the book collaboration project with Angie Renee okay. and Taria Avent. <clears throat> so I want to cut my teeth with that, which is funny uh, that that content is totally different from this content. Uh, but you know, it's going to be fun. But okay. yeah, again, to make sure everyone's clear, uh, I'm planning to drop it next year. I haven't decided on a date. Uh, but I will drop it next year, and I can go ahead and share the title, okay, uh, or at least part of it. Uh, because the title of the podcast today is A Renewed Imagination. But the title of the book, or the first part of it, is Sidewalk Imagination. So, yeah, you know, that's it. That's half of it. Gotcha. So we'll have to get you back, you know, as it gets close to the book and the book is released uh, yeah. to talk about it then. And we can kind of go through it and kind of chop it up. But, right. Um, you know, Gil, you know, thank you so much, man, for taking time Absolutely. to come on the podcast, brother. I yeah, appreciate it definitely. so much. And yeah. It's great dialogue and, and great content. So, yeah, I was thinking a- that, uh, you know, some of the brothers and sisters via Facebook were going to, you know, hop in. I see some notifications popping up on the other screen, but. Yeah, Sancia jumped on. What's up, Sancia? What's what up, on? son? How you doing? Speaking of powerful sisters. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> definitely. Crusaders for change. Yeah. Yeah, we got that going. Yeah, how can people support um, the First Year Foundation? So what we're working on now, still working on, is our high tunnel project. And with that, we're going to be growing fresh fruits and vegetables uh, to distribute exclusively to pregnant women. And you know, one thing that's very identifiable in regard to infant mortality and just you know overall health of, uh, of our people within the core of our major cities in general is food injustice. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, food equality or the lack thereof. So we want to work hard to make sure that more pregnant women in Memphis can get access to fresh fruits and vegetables and ultimately herbs. You know, we want to do that through this high tunnel project that we're yeah. offering. Yeah. So to answer your question, volunteers. Yeah. You know, we need hands on deck, you know, yeah. we, you know so to to get that thing up. So there. Yeah. So how should they communicate with you? They're interested in volunteering or yeah. like to share, you know, how can they get in touch? Our business line is 901-602-6370. You can look at our community profile through the Community Foundation of Greater Memphis, through their Where to Give Mid-South profile. We have a dashboard on Where to Give Mid-South. And shout out to the folks at the Community Foundation. Man, they are always doing fantastic things. Uh, I know Mia Madison once worked there. Mia left us. She went to D.C. Yeah. But hopefully Mia's checked in. She's listening and watching today. But uh, I love you, Mia. Uh, take care up there in Washington, the nation's capital. But, yeah, uh, yeah. again, big shout-out to the folks at the Community Foundation for supporting us. But, again, our telephone number is 901-602-6370. Please check out our profile through the Community Foundation of Greater Memphis, uh, their Word to Give Mid-South portal, uh, and I'll provide more updates as time goes on. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, man, definitely appreciate you on that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I encourage anybody to support Gil um, you know, with the, that particular project and, and various projects that I know that you're working on, yeah. that kind of thing. And definitely congratulations to you on the book, man. And Thanks, Thank man. you again so much for coming on the podcast. Thanks. Listen, this and weekend there's a ton going on. Make sure you support. I just saw uh, Elliot the Man uh, jump on uh, with Mang T-shirts. Elliot the Man Sales. Yeah, shout out to him, uh, Michael Suggs. <laughs> Uh, Suggs is on here. What Suggs? Yeah, I don't know Suggs on here, but 
Yo, so, yo, shout out to him, uh, Philip Ashley Rich, you know, that whole team, um, you know, my, my, my guy Terrell Key. Yeah. Um, they, they're hosting um, Keeping with- uh, School Days, you know, that whole okay. event that's at the uh, Orpheum uh, on tomorrow. So okay. make sure y'all check that out. Um, if you happen to be out of town and you're coming in town and you're looking for something to do on tomorrow, if you're familiar with the, the movie School Days, um, you want to come. There's going to be a showing. There's a whole event that these brothers have planned around it, man. So and Tisha, go be Tisha Cam on School Days, what well, brings back memories? Man, man, man. <laughs> man, listen. Man, don't even get us started. Man. Don't even get us started. Yeah. Really? Shout out to all my Facebook friends, man. I know I've been off the book for a while. Uh, I've been pursuing other projects and uh, pursuing uh, work in corporate America as well. I'm with Tradebe Environmental Services, so I know some of you guys are wondering, man, where's Gil? But yeah. uh, with the book collaboration, not my solo book that we've been talking about, but with the book collaboration with Andrew and A, I actually have to get back on Facebook, which I probably will later on today. <clears throat> And that's how we're facilitating our communication. So, again, yeah, yeah go ahead. Yeah, so here's what we did. Um, we're going to trade J.R. Smith for Gill. <laughs> and so we, we made that trade. We initiated that trade with Adam Silver. Uh, no, Dan today. Gilbert. Yeah, with Dan. Okay, yeah, with yeah, Dan Gilbert. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, yeah the Cavs so, owner. You'll see that announcement. We traded uh, J.R. Smith for hey, Smith. Hey, I, Smith hey, I, I, can give Ty, I can give Talu, you know, maybe 8 and 10. You know, ten and twelve. You know, if I'm feeling real good, you know, I can get yeah. in there. there you, you know, go. I, I, I can go off switches. You know, pick up there Clay you once or twice. Give him ten minutes of work, man. There you go. Give him ten minutes of strong work. So, listen. Thank y'all so much for checking out the podcast. This was episode forty nine. It's a lot of fun. Uh, it's great chopping it up with my guy Gil. Yeah. And so you know, number fifty, uh, it's going to be in a few weeks. So right we're, here, we're going to take uh, a couple weeks off. We're going to be back. Uh, on the podcast Thursday, June 21st uh, We'll be right here at Slice of Soul Pizza Lounge 1299 Madison Avenue Here in Midtown Memphis That's 38104 on the zip code uh, Feel free to come out We're going to be uh, recording the 50th uh, episode Celebrating here, watching the draft We're going to have great food uh, Drinks, things like that Come watch, we're going to have the game uh, Not the game, but the, uh, the draft, draft. Up on several TVs and things like that throughout this lounge here. And we're just going to have a great time. And uh, definitely come out. It's 5.30 p.m. on Thursday, June the 21st. Slice of Soul Pizza Lounge, 1299 Madison Avenue. Yeah. Shout out to all the brothers and sisters, man, making powerful and positive impacts in this city. Man, we live in such a great city. I love Memphis. I love it all my heart. So many of you all are doing so many great things here, man. We love y'all, man. Yeah, we definitely love everybody, man. All positive vibes, man. That's what you get on the Minding Your Business podcast, just positive vibes. We know there's challenges, but again, we're not being naive, but we also know that there's a lot of positives and great things going with a lot of great um, brothers and sisters across. No matter how they look in the mirror, there's a lot of great things going on here in the city and and all around. So thank y'all so much for tuning in. Please share the podcast. Um, You can email me, uh, ron, R-O-N, at... The M Y B, so Mary Yellow Brown Podcast.com. Ron at the M Y B Podcast.com. Share information. If you're interested in being a guest on the show, we can have you call in. Uh, we can meet face to face. I'm mobile with it. I don't have no fancy studio. You see, I'm here in the lounge supporting business. But um, definitely, if you've got a comment and you want to share some information, whatnot, uh, feel free to do that. Connect with us on Facebook. And uh, look for the podcast, YouTube, uh, on the website, SoundCloud, Stitcher, uh, Spreaker, uh, Apple Podcasts. They're on iTunes, uh, Google Play Music, anywhere else, man. Check it out. And then, of course, we're on Facebook. So, again, we're going to be off for a couple weeks. So, y'all be good. Y'all behave. And uh, we're going to catch you here Thursday, June the 21st. And we're going to keep it going. So, thank y'all so much uh, for uh, the podcast today and uh, for tuning in. And uh, we're out, man. Peace. All right. Love y'all.